And can you all hear me all right? Yep. yep. Okay. So um, I am a 90% extension appointment. I do a lot of training. And one of my favorite things to do is do CCA training in North Carolina. Um, but I usually know who my crowd is in North Carolina. I'm not quite sure who you guys are. So how many of you are from Maryland? All right. And Delaware? And Pennsylvania? And Virginia? New York? OK. New Jersey. New Jersey. All right. Sorry, my <laughs> husband's from New Jersey. We try and forget you all. Um, <laughs> So, no, not, not really. <laughs> uh, we have a guest from Connecticut, and uh, is there anybody I missed? Sorry, New Jersey. Yes, sir. West Virginia. Oh, West Virginia, absolutely. Okay. So, um, how many of you are certified CCAs? Some of you. How many of you are nutrient management planners? Yeah. And uh, how many of you are environmental consultants? A few. Did I leave any groups out? Either you're not saying or I did, <laughs> which is okay. All right, I just wanna say that my presentation, I am simply the presenter of this presentation. We just gave a four hour symposium at the National Agronomy Meeting on this very thing, national efforts to align soil test phosphorus and potassium recommendations. And if you all have any questions while I'm giving this presentation, I'd much rather this be a conversation, so just shout out. All of these people, do, do you all know all y'all term? Have, does, has that infiltrated up here? Yeah. It means all these people? Okay. Yeah. All these people are part of this project. And the reason I have some of these people in yellow is they each presented a presentation at this symposium around this national soil testing initiative. And so we've got lots of people that are part of this. So I'm sure as nutrient management planners and CCAs, you all are extremely familiar with this graph, where as your soil test P goes up, your grain yield goes up, and at around 95% relative yield, you see the soil test level that you need to be at to get that yield goal. At the same time, for many of us, and I come from North Carolina, we're just as concerned about phosphorus as you guys in the Bay Area are. We see when we're looking at runoff P, that's your right y-axis, that there's this increase over time. Now, some people describe it as a curvilinear uh, model. Some people see this change point. I, knew they, I know they do in the mid-Atlantic here where this really starts going up. In North Carolina, we just see a linear line. So the, the objective is to try and stay where we need to optimize crop yield without going higher to preclude environmental issues. The other thing that's going on, and I don't know about your farmers, but in North Carolina, we have some of the highest bankruptcy rates right now for the farm community. And our farmers are paying attention to every single dollar they can get their hand on. So another reason for looking at soil testing again is to help with the farmer's bottom line. All right, so when we look at soil testing, there are two major questions we need to answer. And then we need to talk about philosophy because philosophy drives a lot of our recommendations. And let me just say, then I'm talking primarily phosphorus and potassium today. I'm not talking nitrogen, and I'm not talking mi micros. And so one of the issues that we want to know is what level do you stop applying fertilizer because you've reached optimum yield? So that's a correlation study. If you haven't reached optimum yield, how much fertilizer do you need to apply? When you're looking at how much fertilizer do you need to apply, and also the correlation studies, some states use it in a, a sufficiency philosophy, which means that the amount of nutrients you need to add is generally lower than build and maintain. You're looking at the economic optimum, whereas build and maintain, it, it may be a hedge against fertilizer prices. In North Carolina, it's because we have a lot of animal operations. So just 
to remind everybody about the difference between correlation and calibration. We have relative yield on our y-axis, soil test, it doesn't matter which method you're using. And you get these, you know, really nice curves, right? In reality, we never have these nice curves. But, um, and then you have this critical level where at a 95% yield, you don't really have any more response. So that's our correlation results. Now, this is the real world. This, these are messy data. These are from Kansas. They're using Malik 3P milligrams per kilogram, percent relative yield. And one of the things that happens is that you can interpret these data differently depending on the model. You can do this with phosphorus, you can do this with potassium, you can even do this with nitrogen. So there are three different models that I'm going to show you, a Kate and Nelson. Can you guys see the purple line back there? Barely? Okay, well, so let me say that here's the purple line. That's a linear plateau. That's my favorite model. And then you have this quadratic plateau here. If you look at the critical level for Kate Nelson, it's at about 13 milligrams per kilogram. If you look at the, oh, I'm sure you cannot see that back there. If you look at the critical level for the linear plateau, it's sitting at around 12. And if you look, whoops, sorry. And if you look at the critical level for the quadri quadratic plateau, it's sitting here more around 17. So basically, regardless of your model, you're somewhere between about 13, 17, 18 milligrams per kilogram. And so um, it's important to recognize that correlation studies are very useful in helping set these critical levels. But they don't set the amount of nutrients you need to apply. And so typically, when you have these curves, you have low relative yield, which means you're going to have a high. Can you guys even see that in the back? OK. Oh, phew, because I can barely see this. Um, high response probability. At these medium soil test levels, you have a moderate response probability. Oh, thank you. That's better, yeah? Uh, maybe. OK. Um, <laughs> and at these higher levels, and you're going to have low to no response probability. So I thought this slide was really useful. John Spargo put this slide together. It shows all the different soil test phosphorus uh, extractants that have been used starting in, whoa, like 1925, right? Going into um, almost the 2000s. And so what was happening in soil testing is people were learning how to do it, but it was very siloed. It was by state. Um, and so Dr. Malik worked in North Carolina. He developed Malik 1, 2, and 3. Um, sometimes it spreads to other states, sometimes it doesn't. The other thing that happened in this realm of soil testing, besides the fact that you have these different extractants, is you have different machines to measure those extractants. So for instance, when they got an ICP, OES, it's just a real fancy piece of equipment. Now they could look at many different elements, not just phosphorus. And so we see that phosphorus met test metrics have evolved over time. But what this means is that you know, one state will use Malik 1, another state's using Bray, another state's using Olson. They don't always talk to each other. We have a bit of a, a Tower of Babel. So one of the things that has happened is that um, the USDA has these four different regions of soil testing. Um, Virginia is in the south. Uh, the rest of the mid-Atlantic states, including West Virginia is not considered mid-Atlantic, right? Is it? Northeast. Northeast, OK. Are in the northeast. The pink is the north central. The yellow is the uh, western. And what these groups have tried to do is minimize the difference in their soil testing protocol, all right? They haven't succeeded completely, but they've done a reasonably good job. So I want to take the example of the western group and the southern group. So in the Western group, they have two different ways to measure pH. So two does Sara 6, the Southern group, but they're slightly different methods. Soil organic matter, there are two different ways to measure it in uh, the West, whereas in the South, there's just one method. For phosphorus, they have two methods, Bray 1 and Olson P. 
The southern region has two, Malik 1 and Malik 3, so they have two, two, but they're different than the ones in the west. And then the rest of the bases, they use Malik 1 or Malik 3 in the south, whereas they use these other measures in the west. So there are these regional differences, there are differences, this is primarily saying within regions there are differences, and then between regions there are differences. Sometimes these differences are real and important. For instance, Olson is a much better soil test on calcareous soils. All right, then we have recommendations where you have a state divide depending on interpretation. Um, so in Vermont, they look at both phosphorus and aluminum. In New York, they look at phosphorus. And what that means is the maximum recommendation in Vermont is twice the maximum re um, recommendation in New York. So you cross state boundaries, you change recommendations. Or you have a state like Kansas, which makes both a sufficiency recommendation, that's one soil test philosophy, and a build and maintain, that's a second soil test recommendation. They did a survey of uh, some um, north central Kansas fertilizer dealers. And what they found was that the recommendations from the dealers usually were build and maintain. They weren't sufficiency. And they generally found uh, were within the range that Kansas State recommended. So they would be, for instance, in this range for a low soil test phosphorus. But Kansas State's lab makes a sufficiency recommendation, which is going to typically be lower. And so even within a state, you may have different recommendations depending on the philosophy you're using. So there's a southern working group. We've been working together for over 15 years. We've been working on phosphorus indices. You all know something about phosphorus indices, right? Too much? No, no, never. OK. Um, and we were actually tired of working on phosphorus indices. And we realized that across lines, state lines, we have different nutrient recommendations. And if you think about it, even if your phosphorus index is the same, and you're putting in different phosphorus recommendation rates, you can end up with different results in your phosphorus index. And so we decided that it was time to do something new, and we decided to harmonize soil test recommendations. Now, some of us that worked in this group also worked in SARA-6. This is the Southern Soil Testing Group. Some of the folks that worked in SARA-6 did not work with this other group. We joined forces and we said, okay, we've got modest ambitions. We're gonna try and harmonize uh, soil test recommendations across state lines, but we don't even know what we got. So we're gonna do a survey of nutrient management specialists in the South to figure out how each state makes recommendations and then we're also going to compare nutrient recommendations across state lines. Now, let me just say that um, I've got a 20, 30 presentation on both of these. And so you're going to be really happy that I'm only going to show you like three slides. Okay. So, but before I show you those three slides, how many of you have ever heard of SARA 17? Do you even know what that is? Okay, not many. So there is another group of, of university researchers and extension specialists that work entirely on agricultural lands, phosphorus, and off-site losses of phosphorus. This group is considered within USDA to have a lot of knowledge. Oftentimes, NRCS will come to us to answer questions relative to phosphorus and excess loss. And so Sarah 17 has been spending a lot of time working on phosphorus indices too. And they finally said enough already with the phosphorus indices. Let's work on harmonizing soil test phosphorus across state lines. But they were far more ambitious than the southern group. They said, we're going to do this nationally. So we joined forces and we're working together. And, and then we showed them some of the data we had from the south. But before we showed him the data from the south, well, we did show him the data from the south, and we all decided that it was really important to work across state lines. Because the problem with soil testing, it was siloed, it was by state, people didn't communicate with each other. Remember, in 1925, right, they barely had telephones, right? So there weren't a lot of correspondence across the states. And the best way to do it is for us to compile all our data. So there was another group of researchers and extension specialists 
that had been looking at this tool. This is from Australia. It's called the Better Fertilizer Decision for Crops tool. It's a, it's a web-based decision support system. You tell it some things, and then it will draw you, a, I know this is really tiny, and you can't see it, a calibration curve, and give you some information. And it was like, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to steal the wheel, right? So we decided to go this way. So let me just say something about the BFDC. It's not so much an absolute recommendation system as it is to give the users knowledge. They don't want to make recommendations for everybody. They just want you to understand how this curve works, where it breaks for sufficiency at something like 95% relative yield, or how, where it breaks for sufficiency for 100% relative yield. So it is an evidence-based definition of this curve and that's the foundation of the interpretation. <clears throat> Let me just say in the soil fertility community, not everyone even defines sufficiency the same way, <clears throat> all right? What this software will do is it will force us all to use the same definition for critical level and sufficiency. <clears throat> so the tool is pretty straightforward to use. You have to put in your username and password <clears throat> And the cool thing about this tool is that the people that built it said, we don't want people just using this tool. We want them to be f informed on how to use this tool. So you have to take half day course or you have to take online training, which I think is really good because it makes everybody use the same definitions. It makes them understand what those curves mean. It helps them make more informed decisions. The other thing about this tool is it's really transparent. And I think that's something that's missing in the world of soil testing, is transparency. So you're into the system now. Um, the gray areas are where all the data exist. Australia has a lot of really dry area where you're not going to be growing crops. And so what you have to do is, first of all, tell it that you want to do an annual trial. You could also look at long-term data. Or you could add new data if you have data to add. But in this case, we're doing an annual trial for phosphorus, for corn, no, I think that says wheat, for wheat. It's leaving all other categories all. And then you draw the polygon that you're interested in. And here's the polygon. So you're interested in all this coastal data. You also um, add information around um, uh, the, um, the, the uh, trial that you're trying to do. It, set, it tells you how many unique data sets you have. It asks you to, can you see that? No, I'm sorry, the, the arrow is missing. But it basically tells you, do you want um, to do relative yield or do you want to do yield increases? Relative yield is much easier for me to understand. It asks you what kind of soil test you're gonna use. And Sorry, what, uh, what soil test you want to use, and also the depth that you're sampling. So you put that into the decision support system, and it draws this curve. Now, this is from over 400 samples. It gives you the confidence intervals at 80% rel relative yield, 90% relative yield, 95% relative yield. It tells you for all of these data, your correlation is about 60%, not great. Um, but it has all these different soil types in it. And so if you find this information to be too overwhelming and it doesn't define what you're trying to do well enough, then you simply um, put in greater identifying factors. And so now you um, say things like your yield goal or your pH or other kinds of factors, and then you have it deal you a new data set. So now we only have 27 treatments based on this narrowing of the, the information you're trying to find. Um, again, you have your 80, 90, and 95 percent yield. Um, and then it, and so for instance, the 95 percent yield tells you that for this soil test P, for a 0 to 77.5 centimeter depth, your critical value is going to be between 20 
let me see if I can get that, 23 and 37. So it's not giving you just one point, it's giving you a range, which I think is really useful as you, as you think through fertilizer decisions. And so you can draw these multiple curves. Um, so it really helps you think through where, where you need to be for your critical level and how much additional phosphorus or potassium you need. So now I come to talking about this project. We've got this really nice little acronym FIRST, and it stands for something, I don't remember, but we're calling it a foundation for modernizing fertilizer recommendations. All we're trying to do here is get the entire community together to get these soil test-based fertilizers into a database and a decision support system so that it can be scientifically defend, de, um, developed, so it can be defended as a best management practice. And I would argue again, I want to use the word transparency. There is not enough transparency around soil testing. So we are using a stepwise approach. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. We, we want to do a survey of all of the soil fertility nutrient management land grant folks. Now, one of the criticisms we've already had is that you're just using university folks. And that's true. We have to start small. We have to do bite size. Eventually, we want to work with private sector. Define a minimum data set. I'll talk about that. Collect the data and then develop the decision support system. So um, John Spargo developed this slide. He got this quote from Maya Angelo. I think it's quite appropriate for soil testing. Um, you really don't know where you are going until you know where you've been. So about 20 years ago, Dr. Voss ran a survey, soil fertility nutrient management survey. What he found 20 years ago, what he recommended is that we should start working regionally to make soil test recommendations. Did this happen? No. 50 years ago, there was another scientist who said the same thing. Did we do anything? No. So we're trying to do something about this recommendation. So let me just say, a couple slides back, I talked about this survey that we ran of um, our southern colleagues. Again, we have a lot of data, and fortunately, you're only going to see a couple slides. So in the south, we've got three major soil test extractants, May Lake 1, May Lake 3, and Lancaster. Fortunately, Mississippi is in the process of converting from Lancaster, I can't even tell you what it is, to uh, May Lake 3. I know some of my colleagues in the South that are using May Lake 1 would desperately like to change to May Lake 3. And perhaps this project will help them, but in some states there are a lot of politics around this. You guys don't know anything about politics, right? No, okay. Um, and so um, we also asked them if they'd work with neighboring states to try and harmonize their soil test results. And uh, what we got was, well, no, not so much. And uh, so what were the problems to collaboration? Well, that guy won't change his habits, right? And this other guy thinks he's the best, and he won't change his habits. And then there isn't money to do this. Why? Because we've been really successful with soil testing and fertility recommendations. So this is kind of eye-popping. Um, we looked at seven different crops in the south, maybe even 10, I'm not quite sure, I don't quite remember. We looked, we, we put all the states together that use May Lake 3, we put all the states together that use May Lake 1. This is just May Lake 3. Some states use yield goals, some states don't, so we set the yield goal at 150 bushels for corn. So what this tells you is that if you have no phosphorus in your soil based on your May Lake 3 soil test P in parts per million. If you live in Oklahoma, they're going to re recommend 80 pounds of P205 per acre. If you live in Kentucky, they're going to recommend 200. So this is a point spread of 120 pounds of P205. Even more eye-popping is this. This is the soil test level at which your recommendation goes to zero. And for Kentucky, it goes to zero at about 30 part per million, May Lake 3P. In North Carolina, it goes to zero at 85. That's a 55 spread. That's huge. So we see there are a lot of problems going cross-boundary. 
All right, so this sur we have this new survey. John Spargo is leading it out of uh, Penn State. We took the Sarasic survey. We adjusted it for national conditions. Um, we're putting it into a software. And we want to make sure that we're getting it to the right people. So what's in this survey? Well, he's asking for general information like, what are your sources of funding? Does your state have public labs? We're asking things about recommendations. What are your phosphorus and potassium recommendations? What kind of soil test are you using? So we have soil test methods, the micros, the macros, organic matter, chloride, pH, acidity, et cetera. And then we're giving miscellaneous questions. Soil health, is your state using soil health? If yes, what kind of soil health and proficiency? So these are the questions. It will be sent to the chair of each of the four regional working groups. It's a web-based survey. It'll take about an hour to put in. The nice thing about Qualtrics is it helps spit out the data immediately. We're sending the survey out soon. The results will be back summer 2020. If you all want John to give you the results of this survey, I'm sure he'll be happy to come next year and give you those results. All right, so that's the survey. The second thing is defining a minimum data set. And uh, let me talk about that a little bit. So we think it would be useful to have a minimum data set that all soil fertility nutrient management specialists, those are data they collect when doing soil fertility calibration and correlation studies. Because right now, the data are all, all over the place. Um, basically, that's what this slide says. There's a lot of difference from state to state and it would allow us to put the data into the database. It's just that we don't know what that minimum data set is. And so there are, there are all these differences that we have to think about and talk about. We don't want to ignore differences that are real. We don't want to uh, change everything at the same time, but we need to know what is the minimum data researchers need to collect and then help them understand they have to collect this and make sure the journals require this minimum data set for publication. So the definition of a minimum data set, it doesn't matter whether it's a minimum data set for cancer research or for soil testing, is basically collecting information that can be used comprehensively towards goals beyond state boundaries. So medicine does a lot of metadata analysis. They take a lot of studies to tell you whether or not that statin is effective or whether that statin is causing problems. And we need to do the same thing in agriculture. So there are these challenges, um, not only funding challenges, but as land grant university faculty, you know, the sad truth is we have to get credit for participation. So how do we get credit? So we have put together a minimum data set we have had a lot of our colleagues review it. We've revised it. Um, and we're in the process of working on that minimum data set. This isn't going to be a done deal tomorrow. This is an iterative process with some other things that are going on. So we're looking to see trial information, soil properties, agronomic information. This is the kind of standard thing for any agronomic trial that you would collect, and results. So we need complete actual yield data, not relative yield. And we need to know what um, statistical inference people are using. So the minimum data set may differ from our state recommendations. And so we've got to talk about how to do that. So some, here are some of the really difficult problems. Some states require four inch sample for conservation tillage and eight for their conventional tillage. Some states just take six inches for everything. It doesn't matter. Um, there, there are the, all those different extractants that I showed you for phosphorus and potassium. They don't crosswalk with each other. So for instance, using equations to convert soil test values, they, you can convert malic, th malic 1 to malic 3 if it's been calibrated in the south. But I wouldn't go from Malik 3 or Malik 1 to Malik 3 if you're running Malik 1 in the Northeast, for example. The equations just don't necessarily work. So these are some of the things that we have to really think about. 10 minutes? All right. 
So relevant data. So we need to collect data, and we're casting a broad net. So we hired a, a woman by the name of Sarah Lyons. She just finished her PhD with Corinne Ketterings in New York. She's amazing, and she's collecting every bit of published and unpublished data that she can get her hands on relative to soil testing and recommendations. So we decided to go after the top crops based on acreage, including alfalfa and hay. And again, we're only looking at phosphorus and potassium. We needed to bite off something small. Um, and so we have corn, the most number of acres and millions of acres, and potato the least for the database. Let me just say, she's even collected information on sugarcane. Just because it's not on this list doesn't mean she's ignoring it. To date, she actually has over 600 data pieces that are uh, individual um, publications that are in her database a range of crops, a range of states, a range of phosphorus methods. Um, and so you can see the diversity of the data. So she's using Excel right now. We'll go into a more sophisticated database later on. But she's collecting all kinds of information. Some of this is real straightforward, soil analysis results, crop information, yield response. But some of this information is for historical preservation. You need a data dictionary so everybody's using the same definition for a particular word. You need to know what your methods catalog looks like. So this is a really complex database that she's putting together. All right, so these are the number of trials we have by years. You can see we've got some older data. We've got some medium data. We've got a little bit more recent data, but we need more data. So, and this is what she's got by commodity and element. So you can see most of the data is coming from the south because that's where this project started. But we also have cotton, rice, and peanuts. Obviously in the northeast, you guys don't grow those crops. But again, there are a number of crops here that we need to get. And the western zone is like a mystery to us. So we're trying to find colleagues. All right, this is what the trials look like. A few more potassium than phosphorus. Um, and you can see how many trials have been done by state. So a lot in Alabama, not so much Rhode Island. Now, some of the challenges. Not all data sets are created equal. In the olden days, they used to draw figures. They didn't put them into data tables. So Sarah's had to find a, a software package that will interpolate from this figures into data. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're having to do. And, and so there's just a lot of work in using uh, these data sets. The other thing is she's reached out to all the folks that are on this project. Um, she's asked them for every scrap of information they have. It may be a peer-reviewed publication. It may be a station bulletin. It may be an old thesis. She's gone to Virginia and scanned theses and dissertations. She's in South Carolina scanning theses and dissertations. She's going through file cabinets. A lot of the historical knowledge either has been lost because people retired or it's about ready to be lost because people are retired. We have to gather this data now. And, um, but lots of data and lots of people. People are really willing, willing to help on this project. So the last thing I want to talk about is developing this user-friendly database. Can you all see the green in this map? Yes, you can? OK. All right. Oh, I have 10 minutes. I'm sorry. Until what? 8, 5, I mean, until 2? It's 1.34. You have till 1.45. OK. All right. OK. Well, then we can slow walk this a little bit. Um, buy in from the community. If people weren't interested in participating, this project wouldn't exist. So as I already mentioned, we started in the south. And then we had some colleagues from Sarah 17, John Spargo and Peter Kleinman. How many, how many of you know John? Do any of you know John? A few of you. OK, they were really interested in this project because they understood the value of it. So we had them be our unofficial southern members from the northeast. So they started with us when we started the project. Then we had the Mid-Atlantic Soil Testing and Plant Analysis Work Group. Did I get that right? MassPOG? We had a MassPOG meeting, and we had all the Mid-Atlantic states come. 
we presented what we were doing and they immediately bought in. They said, yes, we want to join. So now you have West Virginia joining and you have Delaware and Maryland and even Virginia joining. So we, we ended up with a lot more states. And then we started talking to our colleagues in the Midwest. Oh, I'm sorry, and Colorado was part of this group too, um, as was Ohio. And then we started talking to our colleagues in the Midwest, Indiana and Kansas. So they came on board. And then we talk, started talking to Tom Morris, who's sitting in this crowd, right, Tom? Are you someplace? Yep. And he said, yeah, I've got some great data, right? Yep. Yeah, great data. And so he became part of the project, and we really appreciate his data. And then we ended up with new two nonprofits. We ended up with IPNI, which stands for the International Plant and Nutrient Institute. Is that right? I can't Nutrition. ever. Nutrition Institute. Only they died last year, but the group in Canada stayed, stayed alive. And then we've got another group that's associated with the Fertilizer Institute, which is the lobbying arm of the fertilizer, um, fertilizer commodities. So we've got this buy-in. We were just at the agronomy meetings. I think we've got buy-in from an additional, oh, I'm trying to think about this, probably got buy-in from at least five or six more states, which means we've got anywhere between 10 to 15 more people that want to be part of this project. Okay. So it's really important that this effort resides in neutral space. I don't want it to sit on an NC State server. I don't want it to sit on a Penn State server because, it, because then it becomes theirs. And so the Ag Library, I don't know how many of you are fam familiar with the National Ag Library, but they are in the process of collecting lots and lots and lots of data. As a matter of fact, if you get a federal grant from now on, you're going to have to put it in this data space so that it's available to everybody. And so we're going to use the National Ag Library to house our software because it's neutral. It's not a university. It's not private. Software perpetuity. I'm sure you all are scratching your head saying, what is software perpetuity? So if you've ever worked with anybody that's built software, um, you build software. It's in, for instance, a Windows operating system. Your programmer's doing great. The software's been released. And then Windows keeps changing, right? You're always updating your Windows version. And pretty soon, you pull up your software, and it looks like this. Do you guys see anything there? No, that's what happens. Your software doesn't work. But you've run out of money, and your programmer's long gone, and you cannot resurrect the program. And so your program dies. So we want to make sure we don't have this problem because we don't want our software looking like this. And so again, what we're doing is putting it in the National Ag Library because they're gonna make sure the software is up to date. They're gonna make sure that the databases are defined. It's critically important for keeping this piece up to date in perpetuity. That's what that means. And then the last thing is credit for the many um, contributors. I know for, for you all this isn't very important, but for those of us that reside in the land of academia, we've got to get credit for what we do. And so how do you get credit for putting data into a database, right? All right, so the way we, the way we um, are going to work this is that um, DOIs are unique numbers that identify a publication that a faculty member has done or anybody has done. But you can also get DOIs for data sets. And so a DOI is just like having a publication for a faculty member. And so we want to make sure that people can put data into this and get credit for it. Whether they're from the private sector or the public sector, they'll get a DOI. So this is really important because otherwise people won't contribute. So this is pretty easy schematic of the way this uh, first um, tool is going to work. You go in through the Ag Data Commons, uh, the Ag Library, the Decision Support System. You click on it. It accesses GIS information. It accesses the databases. And we also want to build a, a template that allows people to put data in. So um, I have a colleague, Dan Arthur. He works with ARS. He was very gracious. He built these website mock-ups, and so this gives you an idea of what we're thinking about. First of all, I want 
you'd see all the logos that are up there. Those are all the universities that are working with us. From the University of Connecticut, I think that's our furthest north, to our fur furthest west is Colorado State University. Um, and so again, we think it's important that people be trained on this so they, they go into it with knowledge. And so they will have to have a username and a password and be trained. And then it'll look very much like the Australian system in that you say um, what element you're looking at, um, what depth you're looking at, what soil extractant you're looking at, and what crop you're looking at. You also can data, you can also geolocate yourself. So if you want to geolocate yourself in the mid-Atlantic region, you can draw your polygon there. And it just will pull in data from, from that area. And then at the end of the day, it will spit out these curves with information around them. It won't look like this. It'll probably look more like the Australian. But, but this is our vision. So, so where are we? Well, OK, great. So thank you. Um, we've got the survey. Uh, it'll be sent out uh, in about two weeks. We're continuing to define a minimum data set. We will use the information from the survey results to help us define the minimum data sets. We're also using the data from the database that Sarah is putting together to define the minimum data set. We hope that by this time next year, she'll have 3,000 unique uh, pieces of, of uh, published data or unpublished data that will be in this database. We want it to cover the entire country by this time next year, so it's pretty ambitious. This is the part that's in white, and it's in white because uh, we don't have funding for it yet, so we're in the process of trying to find funding for it. So let me just say that, again, I want to pull your attention to all of the different um, institutions, whether they're NGOs, land grants, or ARS that are working on this project. We have a little bit of money, and we're very grateful to USDA. Um, and now I will take any questions. I think I have some time. So how many? Eight minutes. Oh, OK. Great. So do you all have any questions or? Yes. Oh, good. This is Dr. Roper. He's my former graduate student. <laughs> this is his revenge time. Yes. Yes, Dr. Roper. How may I help? Um, so the question is, he just looked at a data set with 30 years of yield. And uh, some years were, were spectacularly good, and some were spectacular failures. And he had to go back to the primary researchers to find out why was it a failure that year, or why was it exceptionally good. Because in some years, it had to do with rainfall. In others, it had to do with the crows eating the seeds, whatever. And so one of the things we're trying to do is collect as much of that information as possible. It's not always possible, right? Because publications don't always air dirty laundry, right? You just have these differences. So one of the things that we're really trying to do with the minimum data set is make sure that we have all the corollary information that we need to help explain the data. Because that's what you're talking about, explanatory variables that tell you why you had a fantastic year, yield year this year and this other year it was just really crummy. So thank you for that question. Probably not a fertility index. I'm slightly familiar with, with what Dr. Cole did. Um, these are the kinds of things that, that are different between state boundaries. And, and part of what this project is trying to do is break down those differences. And, and probably it will be milligrams per kilogram or part per million. I, I don't know which we'll decide on in the end. But I mean, that's a really good question. And that's part of the problem, right? We all have our very dear held ideas about what soil fertility recommendations should look like. So yes, sir. So the end goal is so that either the dealership or the extension agent or whoever's writing the nutrient management plan can look at the critical level range to find out if they need additional fertilizer. That's really what it's for. So that, so that the person in the dealership has the same level of information as the, 
and is using the same recommendation, hopefully, as the person in the extension office. So it's to make things transparent, because even in the same state, you will get different recommendations depending on who's running the data and how they're interpreting it. So let me tell you one of the reasons why I'm really interested in this tool. Over the past 25 years, 30 years that I've been working, one of the things that I found is that when you look at soil test phosphorus and you look at response, it's a pretty narrow range. Honestly, it's, it, it ranges from about 10 part per million up to about 30 part per million. But our recommendations often take us way above that 30 part per million phosphorus. And so I think what we can do is by allowing people to see the curves and the data associated with it, it will help them transparently think about whether we need additional phosphorus. And part of my concern, because of the farmers I work with, is that we've got a lot of phosphorus in North Carolina that these folks could draw on right now, and we've got plenty of studies that show they don't even need starter P, and it would help their bottom line. So I'm really working to try and help keep my farmers in business. I don't know if that answered your question, but hopefully it did. Okay. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.